Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I am here today to give you a look at another piece of software out there. I've made it a habit over the last few years to occasionally include software reviews, and one of those programs or series of programs, plugins that I've been asked by some of you to look at is the Nick Collection 2. Now the Nick Collection is put out by the people at DxO, so they are very serious about sensor performance, about uh, profiles for lenses, and so um, they have a you know a pretty solid foundation to work from. Now this series of programs I'm going to look at today is called the Nick Collection Two, and I'm going to highlight a. My, I'm going to highlight maybe one of the more obscure uh, programs in the software suite. I'll give you a quick look at some of the, you know, kind of the main head feature items, and uh, but then we'll we'll look particularly at one and to highlight a unique feature that Nick has that I think does uh, maybe differentiate it from some of the alternatives. And so we are going to jump in, and I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit to you, and then at the end I'll give you my thoughts and to give you a little bit more information if you want to pursue this further. So let's jump in and let's take a look at the Nick Collection 2. Now if you're using the uh, Nick Collection in Photoshop as I am, what you end up with is this kind of floating menu launch uh, center where you can put in different places. Now you can elect to uh, just use you know like you would with different other kinds of software. You can uh, launch through this but this a floating tool allows you to quickly select and you know kind of place it wherever you want it to access things. Now there are a variety, it is a collection after all, so it includes Define 2, uh, Viveza 2, HDR Effects Pro 2, Analog Effects Pro 2, Color Effects Pro 2, Silver Effects Pro 2, then Sharpener Pro 3. So a lot of different things in here. Now probably the most popular of these is Silver Effects Pro, and Silver Effects Pro is Nick's um, black and white conversion software. Now as far as the overall interface of the software, it does seem that in some ways it does need some updating. Um, and it's, you know, you have a kind of a Lightroom type. It's, it's fairly familiar if you use a lot of these. But basically what you're going to work with is two different panels. On the left side you have different presets and of course you know, different presets achieve different things. Some of these even have borders on them. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's really for those that want to be able to do a kind of a one-click conversion. Now, in this case, the good stuff about this is that you can quickly choose one that kind of suits, you know, kind of the overall look of what you're doing. And in this case, although this says harsh, it's actually a great look for what I'm doing. But over here you have basic tools then that you can do adjustments to. And so you can either um, add a control point and work in a particular area. Um, you, can, you can do different kinds of you know, brightness, contrast, structure, basic tools. You can add a color filter. Um, you've got under the film, film types, you can, this is more about if you're adding a certain look in terms of your, your grain and uh, the overall look of images, but you can, can further refine that e here on the right side. And there's a lot of different things you can do as a part of that, and, and so I'm not going to linger here too long. Now I will note that the process of saving an image is not lightning fast. Again, um, you know, it's, it takes a few seconds to render, not too bad on my machine, but it's not the fastest piece of software I've seen for this. So if we toggle back and forth here, you can see we've got a really cool looking end result. And the nice thing here is that we've been able to, without even doing any further tweaking, we've been able to choose a preset that suits the scene and enhances the right kinds of things. And that thus gives us a result that we like. Now Color Effects Pro is, you know, basically the color equivalent of the silver effects and it works in basically the same fashion. Um, you know, it'll take a little bit to render the image and what it's really doing is it's rendering all of the various uh, previews here. So the good news about those is that once you click on them, rendering happens really fast. And so part of this, you've got, you know, some looks, either vintage looks or, you know, just kind of in general, different, uh, you know, a wide variety of different looks that you can apply appeal to, um, you can load in. Some of these they have borders on, um, you know, you can of course take that border off and so that's the good news because, you know, that's kind of a look that in some ways is a little bit dated. There was a time when that was quite popular, 
But in this case, I'm able to find something that I actually like. It kind of does what I want. But once again, you have the opportunity to expand menus here on the side and, and so you can work with control points. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that in just a second. But you've got a lot of options for uh, working with that and further tweaking the look. And of course, you can save your own kind of custom looks if you want as well. You could call it a recipe in this case. But again, you can apply it and, you know, in this case, the image saving processing, it's happening maybe a hair faster than what it did in the silver effects, but, you know, roughly about the same. These are fairly large files, um, 42 megapixel Sony A7R Mark III files. Now, like what we saw with the silver effects after using Color Effects Pro, I've been able to get a look that really kind of bumps up what I want, and that was a, a pop to the image. You know, it's a um, deep blue sky, bright day, but what we've gotten out of this is an image that has a lot of pop now. And so that's what you can do through these. Now, where I want to focus is ironically the most maybe primitive of all of these. And when I say primitive, I work on a 4K monitor. Um, uh, this is a BenQ SW271. Great monitor. I love it. But, you know, at 4K, this piece of software does not, as you can see, play all that well with uh, 4K. It's in need of an update. But the main thing that throughout this Nick collection that I really like is this add a control point. So what you're going to do is, so let's just say I've, I click in here. Now I am only working within a certain zone. And so um, I can, the tweaks that I'm making, and so I'm playing with brightness, contrast, saturation, which I can really pull up here to emphasize that warm light there. And then structure, um, as you can see, it's either going to add a lot of detail to, in this case, the sunbeams, or it's, you know, it's going to soften that. But then I can add another control point because what I want to do over in the shadow area is probably completely different. And so here, if I wanted, I can really raise up the shadows, which does not look very good. Um, but, you know, I could add maybe a little brightness there. I could add contrast in there and to, in this case, I kind of like a lot of contrast in that particular zone, helps the details. Um, you know, saturation, you can either pop that way up, bring it way down. In this case, you know, just a little bit extra. And then the structure here is uh, kind of us useful here. As you can see, it helps to bring out a lot of the detail in uh, that part of the image there. I could also add a control point, you know, over onto this side and again, uh, handle that independently. But what I find is that through the use of the, uh, the control points, I'm able to actually, you know, refine really easily what I like. And if I want to go back and remove something, I can take those off. But I really like the way that works. And then it's, it's simple, but then just adding what is a global S curve here. And, um, you know, you can reset that, you can play with that. But what I find is that I'm able to uh, quickly do kind of spot editing on images on really some of the most important things. If you're not wanting to mess with the color, you're really just wanting to improve the look of what's actually there. I find this to be uh, something that produces nicely natural results but it's a great way to uh, quickly enhance an image. And I've really liked what I'm able to produce with it. We'll look at another. So loading into Viveza here, um, once again, you know, there's a few different zones. I mean, it's an image that's got a lot of great stuff going on here. But first of all, let's start with the sky. Here in the sky, I've got the opportunity to bring a little extra brightness into there. You know, I can play with, well, if I got lots of contrast in there, that's too much but I can bring it down to a zone that I like. How about saturation? You know, a lot of saturation in that part of the sky is actually working, you know, because it was bright and so it kind of reduced some of that. And then structure as far as what's in the clouds, see, I don't like that as much. And so just a little bit there. So great for the sky. However, here in this foreground, I want to do something completely different. I'm going to want, you know, a little bit more brightness there in that foreground, um, a little extra contrast saturation, you know, bring it up a little bit, but in this case, more structure is a good thing here in the foreground. So I can quickly do that. I can then add another, let's say I just want to mostly raise up in that area, just a little bit more detail and, um, you know, saturation there in that. And I'm going to add just a little bit more of that brightness over there. And so it just adds a little bit more uh, kind of character to it. And then of course, you know, I can make a minor just 
overall contrast tweak to it. And so just in really a few seconds, I'll apply. Um, I'm able to take my original image here and um, we'll toggle back and forth. You see it's, it's subtle, but I've been able to actually hope to achieve my vision in the image in a much greater fashion and and so help to bring kind of the best out of what's actually there rather than you know completely altering the nature of the image this can be useful for portraits too in this case you know I've, I've already through lighting I've tried to balance the scene a little bit but obviously the background's really quite bright here you got to be careful how much you um, you play with that but what we can do is we can bring that down just a little bit and because in this case I'm not necessarily looking for a lot of contrast in that I can actually um, take down the contrast, maybe even reduce the structure and give me a little bit you know, softer bokeh blur. Um, and then here where I'm working on my portrait subject, let's say I wanna bring just a little bit more brightness into that area. You know, I can choose whether I want more contrast, actually a little bit more contrast kinda of looks nice. Skin tones, obviously you don't wanna get play too much there or too little. So that's gonna be a very, very minor tweak, but just a hair more there and then as far as structure on the subject itself you know you're going to want to play with that but again it's going to be more fine tuning it when it comes to a portrait i'm going to leave the global contrast as it was but again just a few seconds and again this is not making a major major change to the image but what it's doing is it's emphasizing the right things you can see that here brought up the light here but i've brought down the light back here and so we've got what ends up being a little nice, a little more balanced image by being able to adjust in a, uh, you know, in a balanced way or in a targeted way is what I should say. So one final image here. This is a fairly straightforward dichotomy between a building here and then a sky beyond. And so obviously I want to impact these things in two different ways. And so as far as the sky, I don't necessarily want to brighten up the sky. It's the brighter part of the image. I don't necessarily want to bring it down a whole lot, but maybe just a little bit in terms of the contrast. In this case, um, I like a little bit more contrast there in the clouds. I don't mind a boosting that sky a little bit. And then in terms of the structure, see that's too much, that's too little, you know, so somewhere near the, I'm gonna edge it right up just towards a little bit, influence it just a little bit up. Now, I want to also then play with the building itself. And so in the case of the building, I want to add a little bit more exposure into that. Maybe just a hair bit of contrast. Saturation, not a whole lot. And then, but in this case, boosting up the structure is good because it helps to bring out the detail of the building. And so there I'm able to, you know, make just again, a few seconds worth of tweaks. But as you're going to see once it renders here, the end result, I think, helps to bring out the image, you know, darken the sky and emphasize it in a nice way. But then also, if we look at the building itself, it's helping to just balance things out. The end result is a quick, still believable, but better looking end result. And so as you can see, uh, the ability to put in the control points and to control and, you know, to kind of locally work at editing some of these basic features, but just targeting a certain portion of the image, to me is a really, really useful tool. And where I believe that the Nick's, Nick Collection, you know, maybe falls back compared to some of the other competitors that I've looked at this year, is that I do think that their interface is getting a little bit dated. And obviously that's particularly true with the Viveza program that really could use an update to, you know, compatibility with 4K, for example, you know, and a recognition of the fact that, you know, the editing stations are getting higher and higher resolution. So I think that that's a basic area that needs to be addressed. And even with some of the other software, I think that's where some of the progress can be made. Now, the Nick Collection itself, uh, it can be accessed a couple of ways. Obviously, I've demonstrated today as uh, plugins that can be utilized either out of Lightroom or Photoshop. I mentioned that Photoshop is my kind of preferred jumping off point there for the software. You can also actually use it um, if you don't have either of those Adobe products or if you're trying to get away from Adobe products altogether. You can actually use the Nick Collection out of their own DxO Photo Lab. Now, right now, the current build of DxO Photo Lab is two. They do have a new version that's coming in the future. So you can use it as a completely standalone software suite all within the DxO framework. 
And so you can actually take a look at this. They do have a monthly trial where you can check it out um, and you know see if it's something that works for you. And then if you want to buy the complete collection, it runs $149. And that is, of course, a permanent license that is not a subscription base. And so for those of you that want to avoid that, there is, of course, that alternative. So I hope that this has helped you to maybe get a little more insight into how some of these pieces of software work here and whether or not this is a program that you might want to check out. If you'll take a look in the description down below, I will throw a link and so you can directly go to their website and check this out for yourself. And of course, as always, in the description, there's also linkage there to follow me on social media, to become a patron, or to sign up for my newsletter. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.